Hello, my name is Jo and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. I hope you're having a great day. We've been keeping super busy over the last few weeks, hosting various Christmas events at our little studio, Garden of Yoga, as well as our regular classes, including welcoming Anna Hatta and the lovely team from One Heart Yoga. We love it when we get to meet our listening community in person, and it's actually really fun introducing yoga teachers to the aerial hammock. Anyway, back to the podcast. This episode is a recorded conversation between myself, co-host Ryan Bowen and Carla Mullins. I wanted to do the intro today because Carla combines two things that I'm really passionate about, creativity and making movement accessible to more people. She and her husband have created an awesome product called the Makalu. From the outside, it looks like a little lotus sculpture on a wooden base and it unpacks into three different shaped domes which can be arranged in lots of different configurations allowing you to use it for self-massage, strength and stability, proprioception, or all at once in the one exercise sometimes. We'll be hosting Carla for a masterclass on Thursday, 13th of February, 6 to 8 p.m., where you can explore the powers of the Makalu for yourself and get one to keep. I'd recommend this workshop to anyone, but especially if you've got any SIJ issues or neurological conditions, or if your students do, Carla has done some really innovative work in these areas. And this workshop is suitable for students or yoga teachers or any other movement people. Carla bases the workshop around the needs of the people in the room. So it's going to be a little bit different each time, but very relevant to your needs. And if you just want to get in before Christmas and get a Makalu, you can use our discount code. It's MACFLOW, which is a capital M-A-K-F-L-O-W for a 5% discount. And there's lots of online resources to help you explore how to use it. And we're planning to make some ourselves. We'll put the link to the Makalu website in our show notes and also the link to the workshop. Anyway, I'll let Carla explain a bit more about the Makalu herself. On with the episode. All right. Well, Carla, so good to have you with us here today. Perhaps we could start with just you telling us, how did you discover Pilates? Oh, Pilates I came to in 1993. It's kind of weird. My mother thought I was joining a cult. <laughs> um, Is that because you just evangelised about it so much? No, it's just like she's going, what's this stuff that you're doing? It seems to be really important to you, but it wasn't really known. So like now you go and Pilates is in every street corner and you'll hear jokes about it. You can even see memes about it. But back then there were about three studios in Australia and essentially what had happened was I was working as a lawyer and I started to lose use of my right side of my body. Terrifying. It was a bit scary and I was having a lot of seizures and the neurologist didn't really know what to do with me and they sort of said, look, you know, you're not responding to medication and blah, blah, blah. And well, I would, and then I'd come into a rash. So the guy said, Look, there's this woman down at Double Bay. Don't know what she does, but you go and try that. And quite frankly, I was sick of seeing neurologists and trying this and MRIs and having weird MRIs and nobody knowing what to do with it. So I went and saw this little lady, Megan Williams, in Double Bay in Sydney, and she looked at me and went, I don't know what to do with you. Um, but she took me on. And Megan was a former actress and singer, but she also was a Pilates teacher and Alexander Technique Method and Tai Chi teacher. So she brought a lot of interesting stuff to me. And over the course of two years, I slowly rediscovered my body, essentially. And she taught me about how to actually move. And I guess that's probably what I see Pilates. I don't see Pilates as a system of exercises or a system of repertoire. I see it a part of a broader concept of movement and, more importantly, the concept of creating a relationship with a human's body. And that could be through yoga or Pilates, whatever it is, whatever your way is, it is about you finding your body. In your mind, do you think there was an aspect of that practice that was that magical thing that worked for you when nothing else did? Or was it like a combination of 
feeling relaxed in your body and down regulating your nervous system and like doing those proprioceptive things to make some new neural pathways or maybe realigning your spine so that your nerves were happier? Like, do you think that there was a key thing? Yeah, I agree. That's an element of that. And I guess probably the first thing was taking responsibility for my own health. And that's, I guess, something we all forget. When you go to a doctor or you go to any health professional, you hand over a level of expertise to them and they will tell you what to do, blah, 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 blah. And yes, sir, free bags full. What I love about working, whether it be yoga or Pilates, Alexander, is the underlying premise is that you are the expert of your own body. Your teacher is facilitating you to find that relationship and you're taking responsibility. I'm not taking a pill. I'm not expecting a fast solution. I need to take these steps. One of those steps is taking responsibility for my response to stress. One of those things is taking responsibility for my response for not moving and finding ways to give myself time to look after myself and looking after my body, not to be looking great in an Instagram photo in a bikini, but by feeling good in my movement, by feeling free and healthy and able to breathe, that's actually what it's about. And that's you said, it's how you downregulate your system. How do you move with joy, not pain? And I think that's really powerful as well because it's not how does my body look from the outside or what can my body do, but it's like how do I feel in my body and how can I move in a way that actually makes me feel better as I move through the world and do everything that I do. Yeah, my body's my first relationship. If I don't have a functional relationship with my body, within me, how can I have a relationship with anybody else or anything else in the environment? I'm taking control and I'm taking responsibility. And that's what I love. I love being with people. I love being in my environment. But if I haven't looked after myself, I'm subject to so many environmental issues. If I'm stressed, if I haven't taken the time to care for myself, all of that noise, all of those people around me, I come out feeling really, oh, really distressed and shaky. And so I have to make sure I step out, look after myself, so I'm not constantly responding to other people in a negative way. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's like fill up your own cup first and then you can give. And also then you're not reactive to everything that's happening around you. It gives you that moment where you can respond mindfully rather than just like thoughtlessly. Yeah. And I know that there was actually quite a story to what inspired you to create the Makalu as well. Would you like to fill us in about what the Makalu is and what inspired you to create it? Well, Makalu, the first part of it is, I guess, Makalu, the concept is Ma is a Japanese word for space. It's a concept of the pause that allows us to understand everything around us. So I guess in a Western society, we're so used to filling up, fill up the space, don't have any empty space and not understanding that the space between things sometimes allows us to define. And you can see that in Japanese art, but you can also see that in the way we live our lives. Sometimes we fill ourselves up with so much stuff, 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 stuff. And we can probably get more satisfaction from having one beautiful thing or one thing that is functional on so many different levels. And that was the starting point of why we developed the Mark Lou. We wanted one product that was actually beautiful, sustainable. So that's also part of our core concept is the company we formed in about 20, 22 years ago was called Body Organics. And Body Organics was, is, is the principle that we have, is that we want to make our lives as sustainable as possible And that includes every person in the food chain is actually paid a proper wage, so no slave labour. Every product, even our marketing, our packaging, all has to be environmentally sustainable. All our studios back in Brisbane, even the paint from Word Go has actually been no volatile organic chemicals. Our flooring, so everything is designed to try and be as less environmentally damaging to the environment itself, but also to the individuals that come into it. And back then people, you know, 20 years ago, people were like, oh, she's just fruit for me. But now I seem like I'm on I'm on message. (laughs) The world has caught caught up. up. (laughs) (laughs) But 
yes. Yeah. But it's important because, you know, you can't be in the health industry if you don't actually understand everything that contributes to health. So what happened with Markaloo was we realised we wanted to have something that we could use as part of our daily practice and want to have in our home. Because what happens is you have all of these balls and straps and things like that and somebody comes over and you put them in the drawer. And as soon as they're in the drawer, they don't come out. <laughs> so we wanted something that looked beautiful on the table. But then I guess there's a step before that and that was actually why we wanted to develop the product. And what had happened was my partner, Michael, was cycling and we were in country New South Wales and the wheel of his bicycle got caught in a country bridge. And so the bike got stuck. There were no railings on the bridge and he went tumbling over the bridge several metres into a rocky creek. Fortunately, a lifetime of surfing meant that he knew how to fall. However, he didn't fall well and he broke his sacrum, his pelvis, his issue. Had around six fractures. Not so good for us. And No, that said, doesn't sound good for anyone. No. And I mean, not. imagine if he was riding on his own if you he weren't was. together. So how he did, was. did he have to phone you or something to well, come and rescue phone him? Broke. I got this phone call help. And then my son at the time, who was four, Max and I went looking for him. And I I went, you know what? I'm going to pack the car. I'm going to put dry towels, put everything in and I'll drive. And we found him. We got him in the car and it was, he was So you would have had to carry him. Don't talk to him. (gasps) Blanche. (laughs) (laughs) And we got him in the car. We got him 45 minutes on country roads to a hospital. And then he was in hospital for about six, seven weeks. And after that, we got him out of hospital, but he wasn't able to walk. And so he he was told that he probably wouldn't be surfing for a couple of years and that was not going to go down well, is all I'm going to say. And he was back on a surfboard within six months. Not well, you know, he wasn't at his best. <laughs> <That's fair. laughs> yeah. But he was in the ocean and he was so happy. Mm. Mm. But what happened was that while he was in hospital and then while he was at home, we had to do all of this stuff. I was taking in all of these bands and balls and things like that to complement what the rehab people were doing in the hospital. And what happened was I realised I took this massive amount of stuff and it was was just stuff. I had one thing for this and then one thing for that. And I felt like I was sort of channeling Joseph Pilates. You know, here he was trying to rehab him. And we got out and we had a chat about it and we said, you know, it seems ridiculous that... There are so many balls and so many different trigger things in that to achieve one thing. So you had a trigger ball for the knee and you had a trigger ball for the hip. Uh, We went, this seems really wasteful. And we started to look into it and we started playing with ideas. We were cutting things up and playing with ideas. And we went and saw an industrial designer and we said, look, this is what we're looking at. We showed him a prototype and we showed him some of the prototypes and he looked at something and he said, oh, that's not very good quality plastics. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, that, which was a spiky ball, which is actually a dog toy. (laughs) (laughs) He said, oh, that's not human grade consumption. Hmm. And he said, oh, no, that wouldn't pass as human grade consumption. That's a very low quality. And I said, tell me more about this. And I realised that, you know, the dogs were chewing on this toy and you had something in a home that a kid's going to chew on. And he said, oh, no, that doesn't work. And so then we started investigating and then we realised that a lot of the products that we use in health actually weren't made of this quality. So we started looking into the plastics or what's called a thermoplastic elastin and we found that we had to start with a product in Europe and the Europeans have a particular grade that has to meet certain environmental and health standards. So we ended up using this particular thermoplastic elastin. We felt very comfortable about that because then that could be biodegradable and it was also health. So that was our starting point. And we knew that that's where we wanted to go. We knew that we couldn't use rubber because a lot of people have latex allergies. And there's a lot of research that shows that people with spinal injuries can end up with latex allergies as a result. So I don't know why, but that's what it is. So we knew we couldn't go that way. So we decided on that. And then we started playing with, well, how did we want to make this work? So we started cutting things up and putting things there. And we realised that we also loved timber and we started to incorporate the timber into the product is there. And again, the rule had to be that the timber had to be hardwood and had to be sustainable. So we did up some prototypes. 
And the funny thing about working with prototypes is I now have so much respect for manufacturers. I had no idea how expensive the process was. So we had one idea and we had a prototype made. Seems idea, two and a half thousand dollars later for a prototype to be made. And it would be really normal to make several prototypes before you hit the one that actually does what you want it to do, right? Exactly. Like it's just a process. It was a process. And so we had the prototypes made and then we trialled them. We played in the studios and the clinics. We'd put them here and do this and that. Then we developed the idea that we actually wanted to magnetise things, largely because we realised that we wanted to be able to put things in a vertical sphere because not everybody can get up and down off the floor. And so we Yeah, you mentioned this in your workshop. It means that people in a wheelchair can just wheel back into this. Uh, You have metal columns at your studio. And um, you can use them on the board or you can have them. If you're really in a lot of pain, you can't get up and down off the floor. So you can maybe put them on the refrigerator. So this was all part of the process. So then we asked people, I said, well, how do magnets go when you put them in the plastic? And everyone goes, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) And so then we were boiling (laughs) magnets in our saucepans and my oven. My husband owes me some new saucepans. It's all I've got to say. (laughs) (laughs) Sacrificed a lot in the process. Oh, (laughs) you have no idea what we've sacrificed. So eventually we got it all together and we finally got something we were happy. So when did the idea come? Because people who may not have seen this, what the Makalu looks like is it's got this beautiful rounded base with a flat top and then it's like a little Russian doll of like around the lotus seed and then the lotus pod with the beautiful texture like a lotus pod and then there's like a lotus flower that goes around it with little petals. When did that nesting idea become that part of it? That was always part that of it. That was always part of and it. And that was part of the reason was we were cutting things up because we thought you needed something economically or space saving. And it's the idea of space ma was part of that process. But the idea of the lotus was something we were debating. And we had a couple of prototypes and a couple of different ideas. And so we have actually a beach theme as well. So we haven't, while we've got that prototype, we haven't had the mould made for that. But we decided to go with the lotus first. And we, we looked at many, many different styles. But it is very much... There's the seed is the very centre one and that centre one can be used for a whole variety of things. Then there's a middle one that looks like a lotus pod, as you said, you've got the little things and there was a very conscious design and that can be used for many different textures and and trigger points and also proprioceptive work. The outer one looks like a lotus and you will see there's little petals on the side and there was a very conscious decision about that because that then allows us to do certain work on toes without people going straight into spiky Yeah, sensation. people can control the intensity of the sensation by where they put their foot yes. on that lotus. And also how how heavy the lotus is by how many pods you put in. You can make it heavier or lighter. So we sort of did it that way and it was a a long decision of design and then we get to choose colours. And the timber and the magnetic timber, we wanted the sensation of the timber because I just love the wood. But we also have used that as a sensation to give people very significant proprioception feedback. And one of the things I'm very passionate about and I do a lot of work with is about something called peripheral neuropathy. I'm very lucky to work with a lady called Dr. Janet Schloss. And Janet is a naturopath who went on to do her doctorate, PhD work in chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. A lot of people don't realise that this happens. And in doing that, she did a lot of work on research on medications, but also on vitamins. And, her, you know, you've got to be pretty good as a naturopath when the American Oncology Association invites you to present a paper at their conference. Mm. So you've got to be out there. And as a result, Janet and I have been working together for about 18 years. And she's saying, look, I'm doing all of this work on vitamins, but no one is actually doing any work on exercises to help on this peripheral neuropathy. So we started part of the Makalu was starting to work on ideas that you can induce change through sensation. And so we've sort of been working on some really nice ways to use this. It's not evidence-based. I haven't had a clinical trial. I haven't had all of that process. But what we have found is we, of the maybe 50 to 60 clients that I have worked with in the last six months, have all had amazing changes in their peripheral neuropathy from some of this work we've done. And we've had all sorts of stuff about how the fingers work and the hands work to help 
grade strength, load and sensation input. And to be honest, it is the most beautiful thing to see because if you can't use your fingers, you can't dress yourself. If you can't use your feet, you can't get around. And with people with really severe peripheral neuropathy, if it's not dealt with early enough, it's a lifelong thing and it's like walking on glass. I can't tell you how joyful it is to see a change like that for people. And that whole process as well, like if someone has gone through chemotherapy, they've either had cancer or like another really serious illness and dealt with all of the treatment, which is not fun, that went with that and all of the fear that would go with that. And then to come out the other side of that and to still be in so much pain and to like not really get that much positive forecasting from your medical team and then to be able to take something literally into their own hands and empower them to take on that self-healing, like that's amazing. It's wonderful. And I guess one of the lovely people that I was working with was a doctor themselves and doctors get cancer too. And he looked at me and he just said, you know what? I didn't realise consequences of survival. I'm alive, so I need to be grateful. I don't want to sound ungrateful, but there are consequences. And I said, yeah, the ferryman has to be paid somewhere. And I think a lot of people don't appreciate the consequences of treatment. And so cancer, you do survive, but survivors have a lot of issues that they have to deal with. And so the Makalu, it's not only about cancer, it also deals with a lot of people with neuropathy. It's also fantastic for healthy clients, it's fine. But I have to admit, seeing somebody in pain, come out of pain, brings so much pleasure. There's a joy in seeing someone going, oh my gosh, that doesn't hurt anymore. And you can't help but be happy about that. And sometimes as well, like there is definitely a long journey with that type of recovery, but sometimes people really get instant relief with using something like this. Like they're able to like let go in a part of their body that's just been holding on for so long and then like that's awesome. And with peripheral neuropathy, one of the things is the earlier you can get to it, the better the outcome can be. So my philosophy is if it's not Markaloo, it's something. Those exercise interventions as early as possible will get a better outcome. Once the nerve damage has truly set in, it may never recover. Peripheral nerves can grow back with the assistance of the right vitamins and the right stimulation. So getting in early is really important. The other thing about, I guess, especially with cancer patients, a lot of people don't appreciate that, well, one in three Australians will have cancer. That's a massive thing in itself. But they don't actually appreciate that chemotherapy has other consequences. It changes the muscle fibres for people. Just like a stroke has consequences for people is that you actually have less motor neurons in your body after you have a stroke. So it's harder for people to do exercise and to get outcomes. So again, it's great to be able to work with people in that way to actually support them through the process to take responsibility for their health. The experts have put what they needed to do. The person's alive now, but now they can take responsibility and get control of their health. As one lovely client said to me, it's a gift in the garbage. They sometimes have a better relationship with their body than they've ever had before. And I think one of the beauties of the Makalu, like I have a long-term private client who has MS and he has good days and he has bad days and he's really good at knowing his own limits and his own how much energy do I have to put into my practice today and how much rest will I need to do. And I love how adaptable the Markaloo is, like, because he could do all the movements sitting in his chair and move his feet, which is so good for what he needs to work on with his feet and with his balance, or he could use it as a hand weight. Or if he's feeling really good that day, he could stand up and do all of his footwork standing and, like, really challenge his balance on those days when his energy is feeling better. So I really love that aspect of it as well. Yeah, it's a balance concept as well, because, that's, again, a lot of people look at it and they go, oh, that's a trigger tool. And I go, no, it's not just a trigger tool. It can be a proprioceptor, as you said, to actually help support and structure. But it also can be a graded weight tool. And really, uh, the magnets allow you to do that and work very focusedly. And I have some lovely people with MS, Parkinson's. And one of the things I love doing is I really love helping them work on their gait and their gait pattern by various things. As I said, it's nice to have one thing and not have to try and buy 60 different things. And they feel safe using it. 
Hello, Ran here. You didn't think I'd let the year end without me saying goodbye, did you? Anyway, seriously, I am here just to talk about our Patreon page. And if you didn't know what Patreon is, all it is is a simple way that you can help support the podcast for as little as one dollar a month. Higher tiers get access to extra special content including videos, meditations and other things like that. It also helps pay for our transcriptions and we recently got our episode with Manoj Diaz transcribed. You can check that out on our website at podcast.flowartist.com. Otherwise, if you'd like to support us on Patreon, just go to patreon.com slash flowartistpodcast. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can review us on Apple Podcasts, rate us, share us, do all that good stuff. It really helps get the word out. All right, I wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Let's get back to the conversation with Carla Mullins. So this is a little bit of a sweep around, but (laughs) me and Ran have often spoken about how we'd like to kind of make a Oh my god! A product. <laughs> Welcome to the dark side. Yeah, huh? yeah. Do you have any oh. advice for people who are thinking about it? <laughs> Believe in what you're doing. Be very aware of the cost. I don't think people appreciate how much it costs. Every time you get a prototype made, and you do have to get a few prototypes made, it's going to cost you. And you know, so we had quite a few protypes made. And they cost between two or three thousand dollars to ten thousand US dollars, depending which one. So that was just that. Also recognize that when you go to make something, you do have to take your ideas to an industrial designer because they have to translate that into something that can be manufactured. The clearer you are in the process of what you're wanting and why, the better you're going to be. Because the industrial designers can only take what you brief them to do. And I remember we had a lot of our staff, osteopaths, physiotherapists, exercise physiologists, sitting there, the Pilates and the yoga teachers, sitting there saying, well, talking to the industrial designers about the concept. And the industrial designers are going, so what do you mean proprioception? What do you mean vestibular? And... I had to sit there and translate that into a concept for them. So it it took a lot of time. And remember, you're paying these guys by the hour. So that was one part. The second part you have to also recognise is this isn't going to happen overnight. So you have to be there in the long term. The next part that you have to think about is that if you're going to make a product, you have to make sure that you own the intellectual property. That's where your lawyer background would be helpful. (laughs) And getting a patent isn't as easy as you think it is. So when you design your product, you need to really make sure that it's something that can be very unique. And so you have to get some very clear ideas about how does this define or how is this different to something else. And we had to really think about how we can make that product quite unique. So in the end... We did end up with nine international patents and the patent lawyer that we did see said, wow, that's amazing to get that. But in so doing, every patent costs $4,500 there, his $5,000 there, his $4,500 there. Mm-hmm. It was like, oh. <laughs> and then it's like that's it's just a, a piece of, of paper. I mean, yeah. I guess it's the peace of mind as well, well that goes with that. <laughs> and so you need to make sure you have a very good lawyer to sort that through. But you also, so you have your patent that you have to be clear about, but you also have to identify the trademark for your name. So when you identify your trademark, you're going to have to identify a unique name that you can get your first level domain. So .com, that's not as easy as you think. And you have to be able to identify in which major markets that you can get that unique trademark in. Again, that's a very expensive process. So you're doing all of this while you're designing your product, trying to make money to pay for the (laughs) (laughs) process. Then on top of that, so you're having all of that, but then you also then have to get your marketing right. And fortunately, Michael, my partner, his background is in marketing. So that was his training. So he's used to working with advertising companies. And we had a lot of 
work with the advertising companies to get the brand. And they put together a whole variety of pictures and images and things like that. And we had to sit there. Oh, I can tell you. <laughs> it's not very interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, don't we get martinis with this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't this what the advertising world is about? Where's my glass of champagne? <laughs> and it was funny. Our son, who's now 10 max, he was actually really good at this. So he came in and the branding and he's going, no, that's not right. That doesn't have a feeling about nature. And we're like going, he was eight at the time, I think. He was having this discussion. He goes, no, that doesn't feel right. He goes, that feels like that. And it was really interesting to see how intuitively he learned yeah. that. And he said to the marketing guy, so next time, can we have this meeting between one and three on a Tuesday? <laughs> and we're going... What do you mean one and three on a Tuesday? What happens on one and three? Oh, PE. I don't like PE. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to laugh. But he helped us really nail it. And it was a very interesting process even to go through the marketing. And so you had to be really clear on your branding. And what I've come to the conclusion is Max has sat in, by the age of 10, industrial design meetings, patent meetings and marketing meetings. I am very scared what he's going to do when he graduates from school. But it was a very interesting process to go through all of those steps. And then once you've got your product, you've actually got people to sell to, to sell it to. And that, again, is a really hard way to actually identify distribution channels. And you as a practitioner, as a because we're, my job is a practitioner, okay? I work with clients and I work with other practitioners. I don't really understand distribution channels. Someone taught me about Instagram recently and I discovered that I have all of these messages on my Instagram and I said, where did they come from? Like, you have to answer them. I go, oh, oh. <laughs> and it was all this new stuff. But, you know, there's so many channels you have to understand. Instagram, you have to understand Facebook just to get there there. And just because you have a presence on social media, it doesn't mean people will buy. What that may do is may create a brand awareness. But for a lot of products, you have to get somebody to use it and you have to find people, you have to go to places where they will use it and then they can use it again. So it's been a very interesting journey, that process. So, you know, you start with your idea, you identify your purpose. What is your, What are you really wanting to achieve? You have to create a vision visually of what you're trying to do. You have to try and create a visual image for your marketing, your naming. You then have to create the product itself and you have to be able to patent it. You have to be able to market it in that sense but you also then have to create an education process. And that's huge in itself because a lot of people looked at it and go, oh, my gosh, that's so beautiful. I want it. I don't know what it does, but I want it. And that's lovely. I'm happy if you just want to buy it. But there's a part of me that gets really cranky because I don't want you just to become part of this whole buying more stuff. The idea underlying it is, yes, it's beautiful and it's functional, so you are going to use this, and that's the responsibility of finding education. That's a hard thing. So, yeah, I say go for it. <laughs> um, there's some of your steps that you have to do. Yeah. And I would have to say there's a couple of things that have really helped us. One is we have manufactured this in Australia, and that wasn't the easiest decision, okay? It's not the cheapest option, but I feel it is a valid thing. We have had the research and development grant for the federal government has allowed us to offset against our income from the business. So that's been helpful. Let's just say we have a lot of loss <laughs> <laughs> to offset before we make any money. But that grant was very useful. And again, we had to understand how to access that. The export and development grant from the Australian government has been amazing. It has helped us go overseas, go to conferences, go to marketing. So we've been to the US. We're going to South America again in October, November. I'm going to Japan in November. We've been to Spain. All of that's been helped through the Export Development Grant. 
again, we've had to fork the money out, but we have at the end of each financial year get an assistance to help us. It's only for a limited time, but that's been really helpful for marketing. And the other thing that's been really amazing for us is we received a gold award for the Australian Good Design Award. And you don't really get any money for it, but it was like like a little pat on the back. Mm. Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Real yeah. yeah. And it was really nice because those awards were very much about products that are sustainable, beautiful, good form and good function. And that that was just a really nice sort of, oh, that was a win. And, and I'm sure that would help you in applying for future grants, grants. Yeah. and everything like that. Yeah. And we also received a grant from, again, all of this takes time to put in these applications. Fortunately, Michael, my partner, is just brilliant at this stuff. And he put in a digital marketing application as well. And that helped us develop the website. Again, we've had to fork the money out, but it was really nice to get some assistance to help support that. And there's a part of me that goes, oh, I don't want to do any handouts. But at the same time, I don't see it as a handout because it has actually, all of our work has gone to Australians. It's manufacturing in Australia. Income is being generated in Australia. And I'm, I'm kind of proud of that from that perspective. And... The working with Australian practitioners has also been really, and overseas practitioners, it's been really great. So I say let's get more people innovating, but understanding innovation's not just electronic. That was probably our biggest challenge. A lot of places that we were dealing with, they were saying, oh, we'll give you venture support and help for a digital product, but they weren't interested in a real product. And I'm like going, well, we need real things too. (laughs) And so that was the challenge. Yeah, that's not going to help that person with peripheral neuropathy who can't use their fingers to have a digital product. Exactly. And And it's that whole process of saying I think people should be trying to look at finding new ways of developing products and making things and finding ways to create a sustainable society. And there are steps. And I have to say we've made a few mistakes But there's another saying that it's only a mistake if you do it twice. And we're, you know, we're developing the second stage of the product and that's great. We've learned a lot from the process. I think it would be nice to have a holiday, Ah. but not yet. (laughs) (laughs) And it does come back to that thing. When you believe in something, you have to go boots and all. You have to be passionate about it and accept there's going to be failures, there's going to be disappointments, and you might not succeed first time. And you have to take a risk. I don't think we're going to retire multimillionaires, but I do feel like we've created something that we can be proud of. And I do think I've made something that makes a difference. So if you want to manufacture a product, go for it. So there's a really a couple of really beautiful stories that even came out of the two-hour training that we did on Friday. And, oh. yeah, one of the people who came along was from Burma and she runs regular meditation retreats there. Do you want to share about oh, the was, nuns? <laughs> that was fantastic. We got this phone call about somebody wanting to order this huge number of Markaloo. Like 200 or yeah, something. Some, some ridiculous wow. number of Markaloo. I can't remember for a monastery in Myanmar. I mean, even saying that, Markaloo and the monastery in Myanmar sounds silly. <laughs> My Michael's just like going, do you think this is a scam? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, but it's whatever it is, it sounds like a, if this is a scam, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> they went all I, on that. Yeah. yeah, let's ring them up and work this out. And apparently what happened was this woman, she goes every year and there's, they have two or 300 people at a time. No, I think she's 400 people at a time having these meditation retreats and you're actually meditating for nine hours. My goodness. That's <laughs> exhausting thinking about it. And she said she she had been seeing a Pilates teacher in Melbourne. So she took her mar- markaloo because the teacher had shown her what to do. And she was doing all of these stretches and release work there. And everyone's like, what's this? And the nuns are like going, we have coconuts that we do this. And then they tried it and they're going, oh, this is better than the coconuts. (laughs) And so this lady rang and organised for a bulk amount to go to the nuns in the monastery to help relieve them because her comment was 
they were so stiff and sore and they were having massage. And so we did a special makalu for monastery class. Oh. <laughs> and it was really lovely. And it was really nice to know that something was happening to help them in their spiritual practice. And what I realised was that there is a lot of stuff you can do when you are meditating in some of your lotus positions by using the makalu lotus that can help make it more comfortable and relieve people so that you can actually focus. It's hard to keep the monkey mind quiet. Mm-hmm. It was so cute though. I know, it's like a beautiful story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just like how intense would self-massage with a coconut be? Oh. Oh my, and my husband goes, Michael goes, oh, do you think they'll take a photograph? And I'm saying, no, Michael. You cannot take photographs <laughs> it's of like, the monastery. This would be a beautiful marketing opportunity, but <laughs> <laughs> no. I said, I said, no, they won't be able to do that because it's it's a transient moment. He goes, huh? I'm going, <laughs> no, darling, <laughs> respect it. Just enjoy the fact that the lotus, they're all sort of sitting on the lotus <laughs> and that's kind of spiritual in itself. And it was just another example of really made me smile how things can be variable and and how different you're not sure of the outcome of some things. And then it was really nice. Uh, I was at a conference in the US and a lovely lady, she has MS and she was in a wheelchair at the time and she took some Akalu and she now travels constantly with it. She just said, It is my day-to-day thing to get me through so I can then live because the MS has really dragged her down and she gets a great deal of tightness. And, again, that was kind of nice. And so she now she's always taking photos. See? 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 Like all around the world. (laughs) (laughs) But, again, it's that whole thing. You never know what you're doing. But it comes back if you have the intent. If your intent is to do something with the correct heart, that goes out and it will change things. If your intent is only to make lots of money, well, that will, you may do that, but think of the consequences that comes back to you. To make a difference is hard, but it's so much more rewarding. And I really appreciate that in your social media and everything that you share as well, because there would be a school of thought, which is I've created this unique product. People should have to sign up and do my $800 training course before they're allowed to use it. And then if they want to learn the next genre of stuff, they'll need to do another training weekend. But you just put all of that stuff online. And while you do do further education, like you're really open about sharing so that everyone can learn from each other. Because I I'm happy to trademark my name. I'm happy the name of the product. I'm happy to patent the product because that's an intellectual property. But I cannot trademark knowledge. I cannot trademark or I shouldn't be allowed to trademark movement. It's that whole thing, you know, there's that what I call that yuck factor. You know when they say, oh, I'm going to patent the gene and your first sensation is, ooh, that doesn't seem right. How can a person own a gene? And it's like, I can't own movement. I can't patent a method. I can simply put an idea out and that idea can grow and evolve. And that's what thinking ideas should be. We shouldn't be shutting down our knowledge by constantly trying to own it and own this. We see it in Pilates, we see it in yoga, we see it in so many things. And I appreciate that people need to make money, but we can also lose something by failing to allow our minds to grow and limiting our mind because you have to pay to learn the next knowledge. I'm not into the pyramid selling. Buy the Markaloo, that's fantastic. Learn how to use it. And I would love to see ideas coming back to me. I really love to see how people can play and explore because that's empowering. I'm not I'm responsible for my body. You're going to be responsible for how do you use it and how do you need to learn. And I think ultimately as well, like it's so much more productive to show all of the things that you can do with it. And especially working with the diverse populations that you do, all of those people are all unique. 
and even every day they're all unique. So to like try and keep all of that knowledge to yourself when it could be shared and people can see the possibilities, like that's what's going to sell more products. Yeah. But it's also what's going to grow us as a society. Mm. It's it's actually the sharing of ideas and knowledge. Let's not be frightened. It comes from a place of fear. And the more fear we experience, the tighter, the greater the control. So much that you see these days that people are frightened that somebody else is going to know more. They're not the smartest person in the room. Well, we'll be. <laughs> if you want to be smarter, explore the ideas, but don't try and control everybody. It just is going, it's complete opposite to what we're talking about when we're talking about body work. Body, mind and spirit is more than the control. It's letting go of control to allow freedom. I think as well there's a really powerful another layer to this in acknowledging that you don't know everything, like opening up your knowledge and your ideas so that it can be a cross-pollination rather than a small doling out of information. It's very hard to be vulnerable but it's very empowering to just allow yourself to be out there. And it's part of developing a product. You can fail. You're putting yourself out there. So it's okay. If I fail, what can happen? I've created a lot of people who will support me and I've helped so many people. It's funny how they all come to help you. Really, if you help, if most people are good people. There's the trash. <laughs> let, them, let them be dysfunctional together. That's okay. Don't be controlled by the bad Focus on the good. It'll be fine. You know, as I said, there's enough to go around. As well as the makalu, you do movements that I guess would be closer to traditional Pilates movements. Do you consider what you do Pilates or just movement? I consider what I do movement education. I love Pilates. Pilates empowered me. I still always come back to Pilates for my strength. But to be honest, Pilates has a little bit of yoga, it has a little bit of gyrotonic, blah, blah, blah. it's a little bit of everything. And ultimately when we stop saying this is my movement modality and this is your movement modality and we actually stop to look at the commonalities, most of our work is common. Think of it this way. All movement modalities focus on breath and there's a reason for that. All movement modalities have a focus on flow. All movement modalities have a focus on concentration and control, alignment, strength and endurance, and also a mind-body, that process of giving. Let's focus on what we have in common because 80% of what we have is in common. There's probably 20% that's different. Fantastic. We can focus on the commonalities and be excited about the difference or we can focus on the difference and be frightened by it. That's your choice. My choice is to focus on what we have in common and get excited from what I can learn from the differences, whether it be a movement modality or from people. Yeah, what a beautiful philosophy for life as well. <laughs> it's not that hard. It's the 80-20 rule. <laughs> <laughs> I see this in yoga and I really see this in Pilates. Often there's a real aesthetics focus where it's about how the body looks and from everything that you've said, you're so focused on each individual's needs. Do you find that it's a little bit of a harder sell sometimes to reach the people that you need to reach if you're not doing the whole glamour thing or do you just get so many referrals from everyone who knows you that the clients who need you find you? We attract what we want to attract. Let's face it. If I want to work with someone with fake breasts and silicon and lots of Botox in their face and big lips with perfect straight hair, that's what I have to put out there. That's not who I want to work with. It's not really what of interest to me. We have to market ourselves authentically and it's okay. I'm not saying that isn't a valid point, that if that's somebody's focus, that's great. But we sometimes get distracted by a certain look. And when we stop and look around us, we realise that that look can sometimes dominate and we think that's normal. That's I'm sorry. That's all we see on the TV. That's yeah. all we see in magazines. Yep, and you, and you see in magazines 
all the homes are white with down lights, white walls, timber floors, and a very specific look. Granite top kitchens, all of that. All the women look the same. There's a real sameness. It's bland. It's boring. And many people sort of feel dissatisfied with that. So sometimes when you're actually showing something different, people go, oh, wow, that stands out. You know, you walk along and you see six white dresses and you see something in orange. It's the orange that you stand out. And I'm not wanting to do anything just to stand out. I just need to be me. And you'll find that that will appeal with what you appeal with. And again, I, I sort of see it in my little, my niece and I just, She's beautiful, she's gorgeous, but she's not blonde. She doesn't have straight hair. She has curly hair. She has a little quirky. I see my son, he has red hair. He's quirky. They don't need to make excuses for who they are. Just be happy with who they are and find their truth, their being, and feel comfortable with it because, again, it's okay. Really, they've got 80% in common with everybody else. Focus on the 20% different and be happy and Let's stop all trying to be the same. It's boring. It's boring. I can't eat the same thing every day. Why should I have to watch the same thing every day and try to be something that I'm not? Have you always just danced to the beat of your own drum or has it been a journey to get to this place? Uh, I've always been a bit quirky. <laughs> I have to look back. Maybe uh, 25%. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I do think that being an older woman, After a while, you just go, you know what, I don't care what anyone thinks because in our society you get what's amazing is you get to a certain point as a woman and you disappear. You don't see women over the age of 40, like real looking women over the age of 40, let alone women over the 50, on television. You don't see them out there and about. And when you go out and do things, very often you don't even get served at a restaurant. Or count. You, you, it is, it's a fascinating experience. And you can get upset about it or you can just smile and think, isn't it nice to be a bystander? And you get a chance just to observe life and it's kind of fun. And so I just learned to just go, okay, that's fine. And I'm not going to wear beige and I'm definitely not going to wear black and navy. I'm just going to wear what I need to wear. And if that means I'm wearing bright pink sunglasses and gold glitter shoes, that's fine. And you just can be quirky and you'll find your fit. It doesn't matter. And again, it comes back to this thing. What is your intent? Is your intent a desperate need to be recognised? Or is your intent just to be who you are? And that makes a big difference. I think when somebody feels really comfortable with who they are, when they've made peace with themselves... It's actually easy to be with them. They have a relationship with themselves and they have relationships with other people. Way less drama. It is way less drama. But if your desperate need is to be noticed, yes, you can have all the glary hair and all of that, but you'll never be satisfied. Focus on yourself. Not, don't focus on yourself as a selfish sense, but find, find that heart, that kernel of who you are that brings you joy because when that happens you can bring out joy to others and others can give you joy too oh it's such a beautiful statement and I can just imagine you doing that with all of the clients that you work with just nurturing them and helping them blossom into the people that they can be when they're not kind of held down with pain and with illness when they want to be and again that's their job that's their journey They just know that they're coming to a safe place. That's all I say. It's a safe, non-judgmental way. Just from that little bit that you've shared about your earlier life and your high-powered lawyer life and being a little bit of a workaholic and pushing yourself really hard, like it does seem like you've got a lot going on right now with your studio and with your product and with your travelling. Have you had to put self-care strategies in place for yourself to keep this all sustainable? Gin. (laughs) (laughs) I've taken, so I'm also studying occupational therapy. Oh, yes, you'll study as well. (laughs) But in a way, my study is actually part of my self-care because it's a way of nurturing my brain. My family are really important. They bring me great joy. My son is a constant 
challenge to me in in a in a good way. He's a quirky little kid and he constantly makes me question. So for instance, I remember we were doing a science experiment. He was there and I said, "Oh, well, what did you learn from the process, darling?" And he said, and he was 7 at the time, he said, "Mum, sometimes it's harder to ask the question than to find the answer." Oh, so and wise. I, and I looked at him and I went, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I'd known that at seven. <laughs> Wish I'd known that at 50. <laughs> and that brings me joy. Self-care, I probably could do better, but I probably could do worse as well. So I do try and get one or two classes in a week or at least one set class or class of Pilates supervised a week and then I do 15 minutes a day and I truly try and make sure I catch up with someone who will make me laugh at least once a week. And, you know, sometimes Michael, he doesn't understand my perfection. (laughs) But (laughs) we find ways to sit there and work out so that he understands my perfection. It's like he's such a good teacher. teacher. (laughs) (laughs) And we sit there and we have time and we do laugh, but we probably could do more for ourselves. But, again, don't beat yourself up. Have fun. Great. We're nearing the end of our time together. So if you could distill everything you've learned in life and through the creation of the Markaloo down to one core essence, what do you think that one thing would be? It's up to you to find the truth in your own experience. Every one of us has our own truth and I can only share you the truth in my experience. It's up to you to find your truth and don't pass on your power to somebody else to try and tell them that's the truth. Find the truth in your own experience and treasure it. Wow, what a wonderful note to mm, end beautiful. on. Thank you so much, Carla. Oh, um, pleasure. Really Thank looking you. forward to learning more from you and playing on our muckaloo more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Carla. So this is our last episode for 2019. We'll be back speaking with Michelle Cassandra Johnson on January 20th. Michelle works as a social worker, yoga teacher and a facilitator of Dismantling Racism Workshops. If you haven't already read her book, Skill in Action, I would highly recommend it. It's a really powerful text and it feels like exactly what our world needs right now. There are also some very poetic exercises for self-reflection within the book and I feel like this is the number one text I'd recommend to new teachers and anyone interested in social justice as it really explores the yoga sutras in a way that feels relevant and thought-provoking and very necessary. Run and I are both really excited to share this episode and to have the chance to talk to Michelle. Special thanks goes out to Ghost Soul for letting us use his awesome track, Baby Robots, for our theme music, and you can find him on Bandcamp. And Ryan and I would love to thank you all so much for listening over this past year, and we want to wish you a happy Christmas and New Year and sending out big, big love to all of you.